Hi everyone. Today we have with us Mr. Sanket Purandre, who has done his bachelor's in computer science. After which he joined, uh, for a master's technology, master's of technology, he joined IASC Bangalore. After which he has also worked as a research intern for Microsoft Research India, and currently he is pursuing his doctorate in computer science from Harvard University, and also he is a, a student researcher, visiting researcher at Meta. So with that incredible um, profile, I welcome you, Sanket. Thank you for giving us some of your time. How are you? Thanks, so Manchu. I'm doing good. Thank you. So Sanket, let's start with your gate journey itself because uh, that's where I think you we can agree that it started uh, there. So can you please briefly describe your gate journey? What was the initial motivation uh, that you started with? What was it, please? It is during my third year of engineering that I decided that I want to give the gate exam and go for a master's. During my undergrad, I sort of felt insatiated with the way things were being taught, and I was nearing my graduation, and it didn't feel that I was becoming a real engineer because there were many nice. what's and why's that I didn't know, and mm. it is it was just as if I was getting a degree in my hand but with no real learning. So I was like, maybe. Yeah. giving this gate exam would open doors for me to the top institutes in the country and mm -hmm. where i can learn several things uh get to know things in detail learn to engineer right. stuff build stuff and then i can go mm -hmm. out in the market and <clears throat> solve some real world problems so that was the initial motivation with which i decided to give the gate exam right right so uh there's this common phenomena in our country that uh, most of the folks that because i have interacted with a few of my colleagues as well and the initial motivation for a lot of them is this salary perspective that they want to get better salary and better job opportunities and that's why they rather going than going for placements from the university that they already are studying and they go for gate and some better university tier one university right so mm -hmm. uh, why was that not a factor in your case uh, if during your btech time why was that not a factor i would say that was like a secondary factor because i had already play, been placed in this company jp morgan from my undergrad right mm. at the beginning of my fourth year itself so placements mm. was really on my mind at that point in time mm -hmm. but i wouldn't say like i was not thinking about it at all yeah like right. going in the market with a big fat salary is some was mm. it's something which is there on every student's mind who is going to masters so it was there on my mind but i wouldn't say that was the primary motivation got it, got it. Yeah. and the motivation that you told us uh, did that somehow alter after you were done with gate you joined your masters program did that alter in any way no i think gate was in fact a validation that this is maybe the right way to learn things and you get uh, like the exam test several aspects it's not just knowledge it also tests how you can apply your knowledge can you apply your knowledge within stipulated time and how accurately can yeah. you do that so there are several aspects of this training which are tested in the exam and each mm. aspect is important so in fact it validated the thing that maybe this is the right way to do things and you should go even further with this because with gate you sort of know why and how things work but you have not really uh <clears throat> gone into learning the state of the art which exists right now today right right yeah so how did you prepare for it that's also an important question that a lot of folks would be interested in what was your preparation uh, strategy how did you go, for, go about doing it uh so i joined classes with uh, a professor called as rajesh singh watts he's known yeah. as like a instructor in the vision gate classes which is very popular in mumbai and um i think he was primarily one of the big reasons why i could clear the exam in my first attempt and a below 50 rank so mm -hmm. so to to give his background kind of i think during his uh, young days mm -hmm. he had cleared gate several times he also got a doctorate admit in TIFR which is one of the most reputed institutes in the country and at that yeah. time he couldn't join his doctorate program because he needed to provide for his family 
so later he started working for a big mnc and <clears throat> still he continued with gate coaching because he sort of saw his dream fulfilled through his students and like hearing his story seeing his motivation like really like pumped me up that you know mm. if this person like is putting so much effort when he doesn't need to like i also need to put right. in some effort so that is how and he was excellent in explaining mm. all the concepts and driving me through this journey i would say all right yeah i think the clear motivation and especially quinta essentially a teacher when they are motivating you uh, in this way that's uh, i don't think there is there's any need for uh, thinking about the salary or the aftermaths of gate that you're going to be granted with uh, the privilege that you'll get everything may follow but i think this is a good motivation this is a good uh, pushing factor that you have while you're preparing yeah yeah absolutely agreed i think you just need that one good teacher in your life that can open right. several doors for you mm. and like i would say i'm not even promoting go classes here but i know deepak and sachin like mm-hmm. as my friends back from iisc Mm-hmm. and one thing about them is like i haven't seen too many people communicate better than they do so i think right. expressing what they know very clearly mm-hmm. in a way everyone can understand that is their superpower i would say yeah like very elucidate yeah but there are uh, some repercussions of that also because uh, i am a student of go classes and now when that spoon feeding ends you enter the system you enter iisc itv so mm-hmm. when the spoon feeding ends you realize okay this is not usually how teaching is done at these institutes uh, you have you have a learning curve there so i i mean it's good you have to cope up with that as well yeah right but i think once so, yeah. they have taught you what you need to know then it's like you know they have taught you swimming and now you're thrown into like the pool and now right right you'll be struggle in the initial phase but you know how to swim 100% agree the, the fundamentals now because um, for us the fundamentals are clear it becomes a lot easier than to come with a blank slate and then get, got get to know that you need linear algebra background you need calculus background all these things so it's yeah 100% agree in that yeah. so let's uh, also talk about a little a little about your time at iisc because um, the that uh, again it's one of those things that um, because you were interested in studying in a certain way understanding things in a certain way finding out what is the right learning methodology for you so how has iisc impacted all these things for you what are your key learnings uh, of your time at iisc so i would say at iisc like there are two different perspectives you get to know one from the professor side like you will meet all sorts of unique human beings i'll say some are really mm-hmm. good teachers some are really good advisors some are really good researchers and each one of these traits is different like mm-hmm. i wouldn't say like every good researcher is a really good teacher and the other way around and how much they really care about students and in what direction they want to push you in so everyone has their own mindset there right secondly um people there want you to think on your own that is one of the key mm. learning that i see like mm. they want you to ask questions they want you to question everything like not mm. take anything for granted so i'll give you a few examples like for example in the abstract linear algebra course we were asked to write several proofs and writing mm. proofs as part of problem sets was a bit new to me in linear algebra usually you are used to you know calculating certain things like with right. respect to matrices or like eigen values eigen vectors and so on so there mm-hmm. were very few courses in which i had actually written like formal mathematical proofs and mm-hmm. writing those proofs was really rigorous for me because you needed to reason everything out there was no such yeah. thing as like oh this is obviously true there was no such mm-hmm. thing as obvious you need to reason out every single thing so that built in rigor for me that you know if you're going to do something advanced you need to be rigorous then one of the courses involved us building an entire database system kind of so it mm-hmm. meant that you are able to build big projects on your own from mm-hmm. scratch mm-hmm. and lastly uh, coming back to the spoon feeding aspects 
many problem sets that were given to us like it's like way above than what was taught in the class so you needed to struggle mm. your way through find answers mm. to those things and it would eventually come to you so right. in that way like i think making you an independent thinker is one of the key learnings i would say from mm. iic form right and i think one of the consequences of it would also be that while you're looking for your learning methodology while you're uh, thinking about different things that is this way to is this the good way to learn for me is this how i can improve my knowledge further and everything uh in while we are in btech we do not get to explore these things because we aren't presented with this opportunity while at iisc or iits you get this opportunity as you said that uh, these things were the assignments prob- the problem sets were above uh, the level that was that was taught in the class you on your own had to figure things out so i think that would give you an ample opportunity to discover this part of uh, your thought process as well yeah exactly like they made you think you had to do them there were deadlines so they pushed you so eventually mm-hmm. like it's sort of like you're thrown in a puzzle maze and you have to figure your way out there so it's right. challenging it's interesting at the same time it builds character i would say right yeah so at what point uh, in your time at iisc did you decide that you'll be going for a to- or you you'll be inclining towards research because I I think because as you said that your initial motivation was more towards um, thinking about your learning methodology or learning in a certain way, but you didn't say that uh, at any point you uh, already knew that you were going to go for research. So at mm-hmm. what point did you finally uh, became clear that uh, became clear to you that you'll be going for research? Yeah, that's a good question because uh, till my first semester at IIC, I didn't even know what research was. Like you know, people mm-hmm. when they say any kind of statement that after researching this i'm saying this but what does that actually mean does that just mean mm-hmm. that you know searching through a lot of information and then coming up with some conclusions or what does that actually mean when you say that you know i've researched this topic and now i'm coming to you so right. at, at till that point in time i had no clue of what it is only during my second semester when i took some advanced courses we read a lot of research papers i would say Right. and when you read these top tier conferences research papers not uh not the regular research papers i would say which you just find on internet showing some research studies and stuff so these are papers mm. in conference for example in database conferences like sigmod or vldb or mm. ml conferences such as neurips or icml and so on mm. so when you start reading these papers you actually know that you know the first part of the paper always states what is the current state of the art technology and then they right. show you how what are the shortcomings of the state of the art right. and then they will design a problem and show how to solve this and the major right. kick which i got out of it was whenever they showed a solution of how to solve this the concepts were known to us it was not that right. they used something out of the box or out of the world and solved the problem they yeah. used some things which we had already learned which we had knew but no one had really applied so that was pretty mm. interesting to me that these people are using things which we already know right and still they are able to solve some problems which nobody has solved so that mm. sort of gave a kick out of it that wow this is interesting that mm. you know exactly what you are supposed to know now it is just applying your skills creatively so mm. there there is where creativity in science comes i believe in research Right. where you have to be truly creative with your skills on how you are going to apply it right. so that part inspired me and finally when i did my masters thesis uh, i would say a problem was given to me during my masters right. it was not that i was the one responsible for finding a problem so they gave me a problem that this is the problem you can pursue your masters thesis in and mm-hmm. with the help of some people in lab my advisor i was able to solve that problem and that right. made sure that okay not only can i you know fantasize about applying my skills and solving a problem and i can actually do it so right yeah. that was sort of a proof of concept that i i liked something and i was also able to do it so this is something i can pursue long time mm. yeah. i think it's um, as you said that um, when you read research papers of that level even uh which are just um, a pinnacle of uh, the co- from the pinnacle of the conferences and pinnacle of the 
uh, these journals uh, then also it felt like because you already knew all the background that was needed to understand that paper it became a little uh, more trivial not to say trivial but became easy for you to understand the concepts understand what they were trying to deliver, deliver in that research paper and everything i think uh, that background uh, is what is uh, stopping most of even bachelor students uh, to read research papers because it's uh, not that difficult if you already know the background if you're already clear with the concepts it's not that difficult to uh, delve in those research papers on your own start delving at, at least so i think that's mm-hmm. something uh, that you uh, uh, i think clarified that why that happens yeah yeah exactly and you know you see several of these posts in social media for example right uh, that um, i learned the shortest path algorithm like dijkstra's algorithm where am yeah. i going to apply it in my real life ever like people always post these yeah. things that yeah. i've never there is not a single day where i've used dijkstra's algorithm for that example that agitates me as well i think yeah so yeah. i used to think that why does this agitate me but then when you start yeah. reading these papers like nobody thinks that the daily compilers that we use mm. use several of these graph algorithms that we learn like right. whether it is dijkstra's for example if you want to compute something which in which like response time is of critical use you are going to use mm. dijkstra's on your computational graph to find the shortest path to that node so right. seeing all those things which you have learned in theory being applied in real world cases like i was like mm. okay everything which i'm go- i have learned is going to be used somewhere and that is super interesting right even not just uh, that technical uh, not to be that technical to say that compilers use it even the regular apps that people use uber or uh, ola these apps that people use way all these use these algorithms as well how else are they going to do, uh, i mean get the outcomes that they are getting Yeah. yeah yeah i i like maps and everything is something where you see that you know shortest path is something you use but even in uh, the reason i stated like compiler especially was because people don't see any correlation between a graph which is right. a very abstract concept and a compiler right but like yeah. everything is like interlinked and mm. that's sort of like very interesting to me yeah. so let's uh, i'll i'll stop going on this tangent because i think one of us would start going on a rant <laughs> right. we continue this uh, but, uh yeah the, coming back to this uh, because um, i'll tell you what happens um, i'm a master student right now and mm-hmm. it's not very clear to me because when i started master my motivation was almost similar to yours that i wanted to learn how to learn that is the overarching statement that i have in my mind that's why i'm doing masters but it's not very clear to me why i would do phd at this stage i am trying to find that out so uh, mm-hmm. there is this one question that i ha- I'm, i'm curious about because between your masters and your doctorate you spent some time in microsoft india in a research role right that was a research mm-hmm. role uh, so what would have been the difference between pursuing research through that route because you already uh, for people who are viewing this uh, who are watching this uh, to tell you uh, sanket had a research paper published he had a, uh, he was granted a patent as well if i'm not wrong uh so you were doing uh, research at industry level so what would mm-hmm. have been difference between pursuing research further through that route versus the route that you took yeah that's an excellent question actually and that was one of the reasons i also went to microsoft because i actually wanted to experience that industry setting right. of how research is done in the industry versus academia and do i really need to spend 5 years of my life in phd program mm-hmm. because that is a prime part of your youth like i almost spent right. 25 and i'm going to turn 30 in the next year so mm-hmm. it is like the prime time and should i spend all this time as a student or right. i can just be in the industry work my way upwards and still continue to do research right that is the right. main question of why mm-hmm. you should do it. so when i went to microsoft research i met there with several researchers who work full time at microsoft research mm-hmm. and firstly all those research scientists have a phd mm. either from india or from like different parts of the world right and i asked them like if we are doing research at this stage why do you think mm. like a phd is necessary and who should do it and they mm. were like phd you can consider phd as a training program to do research that's what it is it is not that right. you have to you know crack the world's hardest problem in your phd and then you prove something it is not mm. about that 
PhD is a program which teaches you how to do research. If you want to be a good researcher, that is a good training program. But is mm. that the only way to do so? No. There are like you can always spend time in industry. Like you can start your way as like a research engineer first, and mm. working your way th- as a research engineer. If you keep doing well in research, you will eventually reach to a position of like a research scientist, and you can become mm. a research through the industry route as well. But what they said is like if you spend dedicated amount of time learning how to write which only a phd gives you learning how to present finding mm-hmm. problems on your own which are of intellectual interest mm-hmm. only then it gives you complete freedom to develop as a researcher because in industry you have to choose topics which are going to contribute to your product you can't right, say yeah. you know i'm going to sit today and solve a computational complexity problem because i find it interesting that is not something mm-hmm. you can do in industry you need to be yeah. focused in terms of you're going to choose a problem which is intellectually interesting but at the same time gives value to the product you're working on yeah but when you are in academia you can really really follow whatever you want to solve whether yeah. it contributes to a product or not is the latter part but something intellectually challenging and can you solve it is the only question and you get several months to write something on your own find problems on your own like arrive at failures learn from them and so on so you get those five ded- dedicated years to become trained as a researcher and yeah you will see that most research scientists have a phd not all but that is mm-hmm. what they enjoy about their phd that it is a training process right right so um this also happens with a lot of folks that they are not sure um if they uh, would want to continue on that uh, i mean the uh, the basic question that i want to ask is that would you suggest phd for someone who just wants to explore if phd is a path for me or uh, research is a path for me or not or is it better that they decide that a priority to going for uh, research i mean going for phd programs uh i think you should decide a priori if you want to explore whether you're going to like a phd life or not it's better to get a research associate position or a research intern position somewhere at a university like right. given that you're at iit bombay if you, if you apply to any top grad schools for an intern position for summer for exploring research yeah. opportunity like epfl has a program for summer summer research interns and yeah. several universities abroad or within even india have this program of like research interns go work mm-hmm. as a research intern and try to work on a paper see if yeah. you enjoy that but make that decision before joining a phd program like when you arrive at that mm-hmm. phd program you should be 100% sure that you are going to do this else mm-hmm. you'll end up hating your life to be honest yeah. because i've seen if, if you see like was your phd worth it if you even search this question you will find several answers on reddit and fora of people cursing their phd life mm. and that happens for several reasons but one of these reasons is not sure if you even like research to going there for the title of doctor and thinking mm. that that is somehow going to make you superior than the masters people know it does not uh like if you have these extrinsic motivations you are going to hate all those five years right right yeah. so uh, i would also now like to shift gears and uh, uh, focus a little bit more on the story part not the uh, i mean the knowledge part of your life uh, the story part being that what was your experience navigating your part to doctorate from harvard because you were doing your masters in iisc and then you were also working as a, a a research assistant at a uh, not as a research assistant a research intern at microsoft research india so how did this idea of doing phd evolve to finally materialize to finally doing doctorate from harvard so i i had spoken to several professors at iic and many of them have a phd from the united states and at that point i asked them that why did they choose to go to united states and pursue a phd like how is it different from india and so this was from like conceptual point of view and then there were also like financial reasons as well like mm-hmm. how much does a phd student get paid in india 
like if he's not mm-hmm. on a pmrf scholarship it's around 40k per month right if he's on a pmrf scholarship he or she is on a pmrf scholarship it's around 75k to 80k if i'm yeah. not wrong mm-hmm. uh that is one two is like when you are presenting at conferences how easy it is is it to get funding from your university or your from your professor to go and attend these conferences abroad right three like when you are sort of uh connecting your research to industry mm. what kind of opportunities are available in the industry in india with respect to the kind of research that i wanted to do mm. these are the financial and logistical aspects and now coming to the intellectual aspects like i think my professor said that like you're going to meet people from all over the world who are good at what they right. do Right. and that's really important to expose yourself as a researcher because here you're learning only one way to think about it right. but when people from different educational backgrounds you might be experiences this even in iit bombay right now when people from different states different cities different colleges come and approach the same problem with mm. a different mindset so india in, mm. in itself is diverse but then you think of it at a global scale you even see a mm. lot of other diversity of how right. people think about their problems how they write about it how they talk about it how they market their research there mm. are several of these aspects and <clears throat> other than that it's also fun here to be independent to be on your own like to do everything mm. on your own like you know like uh, like finding an apartment to doing your own little chores all by yourself mm. cooking for yourself looking after yourself there is no one here right it's you for right. you so mm. it is sort of like the eventual test i would say that you are mm. left on your own you have to run this long marathon and mm. i think that was a challenge and one should always learn to upskill their themselves in the sense that right now i was at iic you are at iit b so these are like the premier institutes in india but what next yeah why is it that mit gets a higher rating than iit bombay it's not that mm-hmm. you know iit bombay students are less smarter than mit no i wouldn't say that but there is something different about this environment with respect to the mm-hmm. opportunities with respect to how they groom their students mm-hmm. so there are several of these things which they add on to it it's not just about the students it's also about the university what they provide mm-hmm. which makes mm-hmm. them overall a better engineer Yeah, yeah. So I, think... I wanted to experience all of these things, right. and that drove me towards like you know pursuing a PhD outside India. I would say. Right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, I think I would uh, pat myself on my back because uh, a lot of my thought process coincides with your thought process. So it's it's not necessarily that I have to follow the same path, but I like right. the part of your journey where you you are reasoning about everything. You have you already. Uh, uh you do not make a decision by, for the sake of it you made your decisions based on what you discuss with your professors why would you go for a phd then why would you go for a phd outside india what are the not just the logistic logistical challenges but what are the benefit what are the pros and what are the cons everything so it's very uh, intellectual and very uh, like rigorous process of uh, finally making that decision so i kind of do that so i think i i'll just pat myself on the back that i am doing something right uh seeing where you are so yeah yeah, yeah i think that is and... really important because if you are taking that decision you yeah. want to be the sole person responsible for doing that it's not that i got influenced 100%. by someone or like i f- mm. read someone's story and found it inspirational so i went there but at the same time i really not had thought through it so right mm. now even if i was ready for the part that even if things don't work out for me it's all right like i thought through it i made these decisions on my own i had solid reasoning mm-hmm. to do so if, even if it doesn't work out this is something i will not regret right right yeah and uh, i think the next question is a good segue from where you were saying that you know, what is different between mit and the institute iit bombay isc so uh, let's do a comparison uh, based on your experience only because you have experience harvard and you have also experience mit uh if you will please uh, share what how you experienced mit as well before i ask the next question uh yeah so any uh, so mit and harvard have a cross registration policy in between them 
in which any Harvard student can also have a co-advisor from MIT and they can register for any courses that are taught at MIT. And the, mm-hmm. uh, the other way is also true. Like MIT students can come here at Harvard and also like take courses or have advisors here. So there is a lot of, uh, I would say, crossbreeding that goes on between Harvard and MIT. And each of them has their own specialization in the sense that I think MIT is definitely a better engineering school. But right. when, when it comes to interdisciplinary research, Harvard is way ahead, I feel. So if you see many labs within Harvard are interdisciplinary, even we don't have segregations between like computer science, bioengineering, robotics departments. It's a school of engineering and we are tied together as a school of engineering. So we do specialize in interdisciplinary research, whereas in MIT, you will find several departments. So MIT is a better school for engineering, I would say, from my experience. Uh, But when it comes to interdisciplinary research, like applying ML AI to biomedical stuff or to robotics yeah. or yeah. systems in theory, those kinds of things. I think Howard has a better faculty in general. Right. Right. With respect to courses, I think for, uh, let's talk about like difference from IISC in general. I can compare those two because I have attended courses here. Uh, mm. More or less the teaching technique is similar, I would say. Mm. When it comes to like problem sets and assignments, um, here I felt that there was a lot of credit given to the practical aspects of it as well. So they right. want to make you use several tools. They want to make you code. So there will be a lot of assignments based on like uh, coding projects and so on. Secondly, mm. one thing different is like, if you think about like your job as a teaching assistant at ISC, it's either to like, you know, do grading of assignments to create exams, like to design exams or like create new problems or to right. answer students questions. If mm. any, here there is one another aspect is like, even the teaching assistants are expected to teach some sections in the right. sense that professor is going to teach. Uh, like take the lecture, but there are other supplementary materials that can't be covered. The in the and all. Yeah. So all of those things need to be taught by the TAs. And mm-hmm. even if you get stuck at a problem, they will help you at certain words. So there is a lot of help available in general, right. and they want you to right. succeed at those problem sets, uh, mm-hmm. which was very strange to me because back in IIC, it was like, if you're smart enough to be here, you're smart enough to solve the problem. That was the kind of attitude. But here it is like, mm-hmm. no, it's not that you're smart enough. If you need little help, we are going to give you that little help. Mm-hmm. And when it comes to like collaboration policies here, it is like you're allowed to discuss problems with even a group of students. You're allowed to discuss solutions, mm-hmm. everything, collaborate a lot, but just mention mm-hmm. what you collaborated, like whose help did you take in what kind of things if you found something on internet just cite those things so here it is uh more collaborative i felt in that respect uh with respect to material i think they are way more updated in the sense that even if something new comes up this year it is going to be a part of next year's course okay so that is something i found different like they are always making their courses updated. They are like proactive about that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 So more or less um, these. Yeah. So I would, uh, I mean, uh, this, uh, I mean, intersection between students of, uh, I mean, students going from Harvard to uh, MIT and then students coming from MIT to Harvard, I would sincerely request you to use your influence to instigate this behavior. Uh, this uh, idea between uh, IASC and IITB as well. I think that could, because it's the same analogy that MIT is a good uh, engineering school, IITB is a good engineering school, and uh, Harvard has IL uh, research acumen, and IASC has a research acumen that uh, is a pinnacle of the country. So that exchange can help, I think, students here as well. I mean, that would give more clarity to students as well if they are uh, more inclined towards engineering, more inclined towards research. Uh, because that's, I think, one of the key decisions that we have to make while choosing our university to go for a master's. If you have the option to choose between ISCA or IITs, then if you're inclined towards research, you'll go towards ISC more. Or if you're inclined towards uh, engineering more, you'll go towards uh, ITB generally, IIT Bombay. 
So I think that decision can be delayed or that clarity can be provided to students if that starts happening, what happens between Harvard and MIT in India as well. Yeah, but uh, just like, I think that's a like good analogy in some sense, but I would like to say that when I say that MIT is a better engineering school, I don't mean that like they are behind in terms of research in any way. Mm -hmm. uh, I say that in terms of like having in-depth specializations in like for example even if you take database systems you'll find a very uh broad area of research that mit conducts and depth within that as well so e like right. if the number of faculty that they have assigned to their engineering school is almost like tenfold more than harvard so harvard is like mm -hmm. very consolidated engineering school and that is why they are like you find one faculty doing operating systems, one faculty doing databases and so on. Okay. So it's narrower. And that is why there is a lot of interdisciplinary research. But I, yeah. I wouldn't say like MIT is uh, not at par with Harvard in any aspect in that sense. Yeah. Right. So, but when it comes to IIC, IITB, uh, I don't even know why like students of uh, find this thing like is this a better school or that a better school i think each school has something different mm -hmm. to offer right. uh, and not just about like uh, taking the best of both worlds but for example like if there is a particular course at one of these institutes which one of the faculty offers really well everybody right. should have the opportunity to experience that it's yeah, not about yeah. like who is better in that. If someone is doing something really good, everyone should have the access to that. I think that's the primary idea behind the cross fertilization of students. Yeah. yeah. So now coming to your PhD, that your uh, your doctorate, that I mean, it's not an easy task to pursue it, uh, let alone um, succeed at it. It's pursuing, as you said, that if you're not very determined, it's if you're not already uh, clear in your mind that why you want to go for it and uh, what how would you be going about it it becomes challenging so uh, while you have the clarity in your mind what still makes your phd challenging what is required to make sure that you succeed at it um again i think this is a very nice question to ask like what it takes to see a uh, succeed in a phd and uh, just to interject here uh, just out also uh, because um just to give an idea to our viewers what your PhD is about in maybe in layman terms in a few sentences if possible. Yeah, no, of course. Uh, so currently my PhD is on systems for machine learning. So anyone who has like done even some ABCs of machine learning either might have used softwares like TensorFlow or PyTorch. So these right. are some frameworks designed to enable machine learning. Right. So my goal as a systems ML PhD student is to create these systems in an efficient and optimized way that ML researchers can explore and make ML feasible at a very large scale. Right. Yeah. So that is where Not my PhD is. And now coming yeah. back to what it takes to be, takes to do a good doctorate. I would say there are several mm -hmm. aspects. One is like, again, like as you need a good, teacher during your gate preparation, you also need a really good advisor. So it's more about mm -hmm. your advisor than university. So if you're thinking yeah. about PhDs, always think about the person with whom you're going to work and not the university. Like right. I didn't choose Harvard because of its name and prestige and legacy. Yeah, that was something like that came as an add on, but I primarily went for my advisor and right. His name is Stratos Idrios. I had read his papers during my grad school back in IISC as a part of right. course, and I really liked them. So right. I applied to people who might be really good advisors and mm. not just based on university names. So mm. yeah, there is a good correlation between that, you know, good universities are going to have good research supervisors, but like it's a person to person thing. You need to be a good fit in their lab and they need to be a mm. good fit to you as a mentor. So to give you an example, like some students need a lot of handholding in the beginning of their PhD that, you know, advisor tells them that you should go and do this. You should go and do that. Uh, yeah. They give the initial problem and they train these students. And eventually in the third or fourth year, they become more independent. 
Right. Some other advisors like mine, like mm. he is someone who is going to give you high level advice and leave you out in the open. So you struggle a lot, mm. but at the same mm. time you become more independent right from the beginning. Right. So you need to decide what kind of advisor is a good fit for you. That is one. Mm. Second, I think. I would say like uh being smart or like is is something which is very secondary in PhD. I think like it is not mm. about how smart you are with respect to solving problems. It is about how consistent and disciplined you are. So when it takes to okay. comes to like gate exams or like doing courses, it's an exam. It's like you know there is something very deterministic. If you do this, you are going to get this. It's very right. deterministic. in research every day you are dealing with some unknown mm. and to take this unknown to known like it involves a series of steps and there is there are only few days in which you you'll find that euphoria that oh wow i've cracked this problem oh wow something happened but a lot of days mm-hmm. are doing the same things over and over again so right. it takes a lot of consistency like many days are going to be mundane like mm. you are going there doing the same thing repeating those things and doing like it's a cycle of repetitions that you have to continue for example mm. even when we talk about these big scientists like einstein or something it's not like every day they were making those discoveries discoveries right. happens yeah. once in like one year or something other 364 days they were like doing the same thing again and again so right it's a very rigorous and mundane routine that you have to follow with discipline so i think discipline and consistency are way important here than you know your motivation and smartness mm mm-hmm. and finally it is about do you like to be challenged and are or are you okay with failures like many ideas you will try are not going to work and right. you have to find out why they didn't work and so on so it is it is very important that you are okay with like not succeeding and that is something which okay. i have even at iic many toppers struggle with so many people come with like really good gate ranks or like good ranks from their institute and when they mm. find themselves to get like let's say a grade which is average in class they really struggle with the fact that you know they are no longer at the top of the top they are average mm. here so yeah. it doesn't matter like you just have to see where you went wrong and move ahead if you are mm. in that mentality that you know i can't fail i have to be at the top or how could i do this thing wrong you're not going to succeed in your phd so have a good big appetite for failure no. so I, these are some of the aspects like your advisor your consistency and your appetite for failures which are essential for phd no um i would like to backtrack a little i think i should have asked this earlier but it's again something that i'm also curious about and a uh, uh, lot of people would be um because it's not an easy process to get into a university abroad especially a university that ranks among uh, top 10 to be uh, very broad i think top 5 or top 3 even harvard ranks among that um in the world uh, so what was the process like uh, not to go into a lot of depth but what was that uh, po- process logistically like for you mm, logistically i think it's about writing a good research statement which is right. like people call it sop statement of purpose it's more of a research statement of what you have done what are the mm. skills you have and how you are going to be a useful person in the other person's uh, lab that is one mm. two is like letters of recommendation these are really important like these are something which sort of support what you write in your research statement like uh-huh. if a professor from I- iisc or iitb is vouching for you that this person is good in research uh-huh. that carries a lot of weight than any of your grade let's uh-huh. say you get a a grade in your ml course but if your ml professor does not write in his letter of recommendation that you are an excellent researcher who is independent and can solve problems that grade mm. a means nothing that grade a only means that you are able to solve machine learning assignment questions that's it right so what your uh, like what the people are writing about you in their letters of recommendation mm. is of utmost importance and third is about like really doing 
good survey in terms of what the faculty in these institutes are doing what kind of research they are doing do you have the skill set necessary does your philosophical ideology align with what they are doing and how you are going mm-hmm. to be a good fit so you need to do a very deep in depth survey with respect to their students these professors and this takes time i think i took around 2 to 3 months to just do this like to really set read research papers what these people are doing is this something i really want to do do i like right. this would i be a good fit in this professor's lab and so on so mm-hmm. because if you really find a person who will be a good fit for you naturally that means that that person is also going to be interested in what you have written what people are talking mm-hmm. about you and that creates a good fit for you so right. so i think these three are important things uh, like having a clear research statement of what you want to do mm-hmm. in your phd and be genuine in that like especially for top universities if you're applying if you're going to search for research statements and sops online and use the same pattern which other people write mm-hmm. the, like i'm telling you upfront you will be rejected that is why most people don't make it to those universities because a research statement or a statement of purpose is something which needs to be genuinely written it's need it needs to be your story right if right things like you know i was a child prodigy i started thinking about compilers when i was like in my 5th grade or something nobody is going to believe you and nobody really cares like how big yeah. of a computer science geek you were when you were in 5th grade mm. it is about what you know why do you like research and why do you want to do phd and you should be really honest about it like these people have been reading sta- like research statements from several students for years they know who yeah. is bullshitting who is not yeah so write a genuine statement do the groundwork before such that people are going to write flying letters of recommendation for you skills for which you want to be endorsed yeah. before so lay that groundwork before and then mm-hmm. like find good fit for yourself like i would say like these are the broad three steps yeah not it um so coming back to uh, your research work uh, right now you are a research scholar at meta working on i think pytorch if i'm not yeah, wrong yeah right mm-hmm. yeah so can you please uh, share a little bit of your experience uh, working at meta what that is like and uh, um, how it is kind uh, to just contrast it with the industrial research uh, uh, it contrast industrial research with the research that is pursued um in academia uh, because you already have mentioned that the goals are fixed and you are, you are supposed to focus on this even if you are getting a brilliant idea your idea should be kind of in the direction of the outcome that the uh, industry wants right so uh, just to uh, give that more tangible give that in a more tangible way what uh, are the uh, what is your experience between uh, working at harvard versus meta one is like i think speed like mm. people in academia expect perfection that you take one problem solve it end to end and then right. like take your time do rigorous experimentation show results in ev- all of those cases and really mm. reason out why your technique works so it's about that elegance that perfection and that grace in academia in industry is it, a, it is about speed take mm. something which works for most of the cases which is fast it doesn't need to be perfect and gives results on most things really well so that is right. one of the key differences that is a ideological difference i feel mm-hmm. to find something which is really elegant perfect and works on all cases that is uh, a different ideology than finding something that works for most cases is fast quick and you can deploy it asap so that is one thing dif- uh, different between like meta's ideology and the kind of research i do secondly uh again it's not about creating those perfect solutions which are really fancy and work on everything like they cover all the cases bottom up it's about making a simple and clean solution that is of utmost importance in industry your solution needs to be as simple as possible and as clean as possible so that is something which is highly valued in industry like design something very simple that gives really good results 
so to give you a tangible example if you have a very fancy algorithm that runs in polynomial time and like gives you 80% improvement versus if you have like a quick linear algorithm that gives you 50% oh. of improvement but it is very simple and clean people are going to go for that 50% no brainer oh. like people want something simple clean works quickly that is something right. which is highly appreciated in industry but now this is i'm speaking with respect to the pytorch team at meta which is sort of a research and engineering division i would say there is a separate right. team called as facebook ai research fair so yeah that teams deals with more researchy aspects it is not that they need to deliver something really really quick so mm. there you can expect some fancy solutions being applied for particular cases and so on mm. and one other thing is like in academia you like to classify some things like you know i am solving this for an entire class of problems mm. in industry if there is optimization that works even for like some top 5 models which are being used you will go right. for it you will not think about like entire class of problems is it general enough to be applied to all of those or no you will mm. see what is your workload currently if it is these mm. five things and if i have something that works for these five things i'm going to go and apply it yeah yeah so Maybe it, it is boils down to the impact of uh, the work that i mean if let's say for llms if something some optimization works but for some let's say uh, vision models it does not work of course uh facebook would want that to be deployed somehow asap yeah. if it works yeah. Yeah. yeah so yeah it is something that you keep prototyping and iterating over to make things better so you can't yeah. wait for a perfect solution in academia mm. people like that perfect solution it is about like making the problem complete uh, addressing it from all aspects and showing limitation where you can't really address it so mm-hmm. so i think that's a, a good overview and not just an overview that's a good amount of detail that we have covered about your journey and uh, uh, one thing that i would uh, like to ask, i like to ask it a lot uh, so i would also like to ask it to you as well that seeing where you are now i mean uh, uh, let's not be modest it's a uh, very um, uh, and somebody uh, would aspire very highly to be where you are right so it's um, very exceptionally brilliant what you have um, achieved uh, of course through your hard work nothing nothing out of flow obviously uh, so is there still some advice that you think you would give to your younger self let's say um, while you were preparing for your gate or maybe while you were pursuing your masters some somewhere along the line is there something that you would uh, want your younger self to know um i would say like take things a bit lightly in the sense that you know if something doesn't work don't take it to your heart just go mm-hmm. on to the next thing so mm-hmm. don't be stuck at places where you know you got a c in a course you got a zero mm-hmm. in an assignment or let's say you were aiming for certain company and somehow the, you screwed up the interview so there mm-hmm. are a lot of these small things that are going to keep on happening but in the bigger picture it doesn't matter like you yeah. just have to see where it went wrong learn from it move ahead so that is yeah. something i cherish right now that i do not think about where things go wrong i learn from it and move ahead right okay um last question what is the path that you are thinking about exploring after you are done with your phd um i think i want to go in industry for now Mm. especially in the research aspect but there is always this thing of startup in my mind and mm. at some point in like my career like in the next 10 years i would like to uh be a part of an early stage startup if it comes from my ideas well and good if it doesn't like at least contribute to someone else's startup mm. but i want to see something being built from scratch on a large scale and i feel right. now is the time where i have that kind of energy to put in those long hours and mm-hmm. it's quite exciting because one thing in big tech is like um you cannot take too many risky directions 
because most of things are ironed out for you so right. like that company already runs it knows its business model it knows its core competencies right and so so there are a lot of things which are ironed out for you in startup like that's more of something you can do you have more right. freedom i would say and right. it is challenging in in the sense that you are going to learn several aspects not just the technical aspect as well it's about people right. managing it's about some financing pitching your like product to the clients and so on so there are several other aspects which i find interesting and mm-hmm. i would like to give it a try at some point nice yeah. so i would uh, at some point if i somehow get an idea i would just humbly drop you a message sir if you're free <laughs> or, of course like that. i'm always always open to uh, hearing new ideas so definitely definitely, definitely. yeah and if in case you already have an idea just uh, remember your junior in from iit bombay <laughs> i'm also always interested in new ideas yeah so thank you sagit uh, uh, there is one thing i would like to say like about deepak and sachin especially so yeah. i don't know if many people from go classes know about that but like deepak was excellent in creating these memes and mm. people always see the funny side of it but i like i like the part that he was also doing it when he was in at iisc so even yeah. in all those stressful phases where you had these deadlines coming up you were learning something new and all those things he could see the funny side of it and i think that is a yeah. great quality and same is true about sachin like i have always seen these people you know finding humor in like very small daily life things and yeah. i think s- for sachin he he struggled with i think some portion of ml or something i remember in his second year and from there he just nailed that down and even by the end of the semester he was already teaching his own classmates to a large extent so i have had like first hand experiences with both of them and right. that is one of the reasons why i was like really happy to do this interview and it's oh. a shout out for them like it's a no brainer that like these people are going to make you better engineers than you were if you join go classes like i'm not promoting this but i can really vouch for these two right yeah i mean it shows in the result not to uh, be uh, not to boast myself but uh, i mean uh, what i have uh, what result i have gotten um, uh, in gate or what i'm currently doing is a uh, accumulation of what I, i have learned from them because that that's exactly was my idea as well that you started with that i wanted to learn how to learn uh, i wanted to have a better teaching uh, learning methodology uh, for let's just take a, for example a theory of computation when you're studying it in just the way that you are taught in btech you are not thinking about the uh, brilliance of it the beauty of it the idea of computation starting from something the theory of it the, that turning into compute computers now workstations to super computers quantum computers what not the idea of this how what computation essentially is you wouldn't appreciate any of these if you study it the way uh, you are generally taught in the universities uh, at btech level uh, let's just say tier 2 tier 3 universities um, not to count uh, universities like iit bombay isc maybe uh but when when i studied these courses from uh, deepak sir from sachin sir and uh, yeah again this uh, aspect of meme that is still going on people who are part of go classes or who somehow look uh, get to see the lectures on youtube because they do release uh, some lectures on youtube as well so they would know this that this meme thing is still going on deepak sir is at his peak uh, thinking about the memes uh, at certain points i also start to think how creative can he be with his memes so that happens and that i think uh, their support is uh, an essential part of um, the out- outcome that i have achieved the way they have supported not, not just in technical aspect how they teach their teaching methodology and everything but also in other aspects to keep things light for you to keep it to make things easy for you to give you the right path essentially that uh, i think um, that i don't think that uh, many teachers provide as you said that one right teacher can make yeah. the difference i got to yeah i think so, that's yeah. a excellent thing like i think you need that one mentor always so i think during mm. my gate preparation it was uh, like rajesh sir 
during yeah. iisc it was my advisor professor jayan tharit sir right now yeah. then during microsoft it is like my mentor Car- dr kartik ramchandra and now yeah. i have like professor stratos so at yeah. each point in time i have found this one mentor whom i can trust and rely on and yeah. you need that someone who is your mentor to like you know have this unilateral backing behind you whom you can trust rely on and who is going mm. to show you the right path so you need everyone yeah. needs some sort of guidance and yeah. finding that is essential and if you know these people whom you can rely on it is it makes a huge difference right right so thank you sanket for all the time that you have given to us and uh, like i was just like on a on just a closing thought that i have because this uh, overarchingly was the idea of this series of life after gate that it's not just about the glory that you see that people get out after gate how they achieve it the thought process that goes behind it and because uh, from your journey i can i feel inspired myself because it's not that uh, is the outcome or it's not the uh, motivation for you to uh, be at harvard harvard is not a motivation it's an outcome or it's an it's a um, side product of your motivation to work in a certain way to learn in a certain way to uh, think in a certain way to keep, keep challenging yourself all these things and these institutes these research paper these conferences are all just a uh, by products of it so it's extremely motivating for me and i hope that a lot of our viewers who are watching this would be motivated uh, by your thought process by the um, mentality that you have the approach that you have uh towards things in your life and uh, so thank you thanks a lot for uh, giving us your time yeah thanks so much for having me appreciate it thank you see you see you bye